Well, then, okay, it says the session is being recorded. That's good. Okay, so we're in. So we're in. Okay, All right. I'm going to start this um, recording. And I apologize to everybody who's dialed in already. Um, it was an error on my part. So um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Conservation and Management of Amphibians and Reptiles for U.S. National Parks in the Northeast. This is the third in a four-part series. My name is Jen Williams. I'm the Federal Coordinator for Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. Um, there will be two opportunities during the presentation to ask questions, and the presenters will announce when those times are available. Um, but in the meantime, if you wanted to, you could submit um, comments during the presentation by using the questions box on your control panel. So if you just type a message um, during that uh, question and answer time, I will just read the questions to the speakers. So we are recording right now. Um, please email me at Jen, J-E-N underscore Williams. That's with an S at nps.gov, so N for national, P for park, S for service. And that way um, you can get a recording of the webinar. So today's webinar features um, Dr. Joe Mitchell, and he has a PhD in ecology from the University of Tennessee. And he is focused on conservation, ecology, and natural history of amphibians and reptiles for over 40 years. Joe is self-employed and he has conducted conservation and management research on 16 national parks and 21 military bases, among other properties as well. He wrote the first habitat conservation plan under a joint venture by two federal agencies, and those agencies were the Forest Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service. And he is the author of The Reptiles of Virginia, and he is the senior editor of Urban Herpetology. Our um, uh, our second presenter is Al Breisch. He received his BS from Penn State and his MS from the University at Albany. He is currently a collaborator with the Roosevelt Wildlife Station at the College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Previously, Al was the amphibian and reptile specialist for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, but he um, since retired in 2009. He is the director of the New York Amphibian and Reptile Atlas Project and co-author of the Amphibians and Reptiles of New York State, Identification, Life History, and Conservation. Al co-chaired the Joint National Steering Committee for Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation, and um, the Joint National Steering Committee is the governing body for PARC, and he also co-chaired Northeast PARC, which is one of five regional working groups for PARC. Kurt Buhlman holds a BS in Environmental Studies from Stock. Stockton State College in New Jersey. He received his MS in Wildlife Sciences from Virginia Tech and a PhD in Ecology from the University of Georgia. Kurt has worked with the Nature Conservancy, the U.S. Forest Service, Conservation International, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and others. He is currently a senior research associate with the University of Georgia's Savannah River Ecology Lab. He also operates Buhlman Ecological Research and Consulting as an environmental consultant. Kurt's research interests include life history and evolutionary ecology with application for species recovery, conservation, and management. He has studied terrestrial habitat needs of amphibians and reptiles around seasonal wetlands, the effects of prescribed fire, control of invasive species, and wetland restoration. He has been involved with turtle habitat management and restoration projects and has helped implement reintroduction strategies for gopher tortoises at several sites in the <coughs> southeast, and more recently, head starting research with freshwater turtles, such as Blandings and Wood, in the northeast, as well as with desert tortoises in the Mojave Desert. So there, after this webinar, there will be one more webinar focusing on habitat management guidelines um, to assist natural resource managers with the amphibian and reptile conservation. So we've already completed the Northwest and the Midwest webinars, and the Southeastern webinar is coming up in October. So again, please contact me if you're interested in the other recordings. I can be reached at Jen underscore Williams at NPS.gov. Okay, so take it away. Hi, folks. Uh, this is Joe Mitchell. Uh, we re really appreciate you uh, joining us on this webinar, the first that the three of us have ever given. Um, PARC, Partisan Amphibian and Reptile Conservation, was formed in 1999 with the following mission, to conserve amphibians, reptiles, and their habitats as integral parts of our ecosystem and culture through proactive and coordinated public-private partnerships and underscore partnerships. Uh, first of all, we'd like to 
extend the gratitude to the Wildlife Conservation Branch and the Biological Resources Division of the National Park Service. We appreciate their support. PARC is a diverse group of professional biologists, natural resource managers, like-minded citizens, and organizations who work towards inclusive reptile and amphibian conservation. There are, I think, just about every federal agency, including DOD, uh, all 50 states uh, are partners of uh, a large number of NGOs, uh, university academic professional societies, and so on. So it's a big group. Um, we've developed uh, several useful tools to help with management and conservation of amphibians and reptiles. Um, on the left is the Inventory and Monitoring Handbook, and uh, I don't believe that one is yet on, online, so you need to contact uh, Jen or uh, Use the, or go to the uh, main park website. Uh, on, the, on the right is the Habitat Management Guidelines book that we produced for the Northeastern region. Um, in the middle is a relatively new program focusing on priority amphibian and reptile conservation areas. Okay. Park is divided into five different regions. We follow Fish and Wildlife Service um, boundaries, um, and it, it, it includes Alaska and uh, several state chapters and we let's see go back. Oh yeah, we are we are also in collaboration with Canada, Mexico and the Caribbean. So it's not just the United States, it's uh, basically North America. Uh, there are 163 total national park lands in the Northeast region. Uh, every state but Delaware has uh, one or more. Uh, it includes uh, parks, historical sites, battlefields, seashores, heritage corridors, recreation areas, scenic rivers, and scenic trails. Just about everybody. Um, the Northeast encompasses uh, 17 different ecoregions. And I want to, want to point out that the ecoregions don't stop at state bound at the, at the uh, uh, regional boundary. It, it certainly it, over, it overlap, or they, in, they, they overlap into the, the Midwest and the Southeast. So the habitat management guidelines for all three of those regions are useful and may uh, may actually be, be applicable to some of the things you want to do. Um, HERPs have lagged behind other taxonomic groups in research, habitat management, and conservation, and I'll add funding. Um, so we need to understand the biology and life history of these guys in order to effectively manage them. Uh, a lot of them use both aquatic and terrestrial habitats. In some cases, like frogs, individuals, this individual is, uh, is, uses aquatic and terrestrial habitats. There's a very wide variability of uh, life histories and so on. And there are 163 species of amphibian reptiles in the Northeast in this region. The Northeast has high species diversity, especially with salamanders and turtles. We have 8% of the Earth's salamanders and 11% of the Earth's turtles. Six species are endemic. Uh, the one on the, the frog is the New Jersey corn frog, and the salamander is the peaks of otter salamander, which occurs in Virginia. Uh, a couple of species have been introduced to other regions and, in fact, around the world. Uh, the bullfrog is having a, uh, creating a lot of problems in, out, out west for, for uh, amphibians. And the reader slider is uh, just about everywhere anymore, and it's causing some uh, serious problems in Europe and other places. And France has banned their import, for example. Okay. Lots of interesting things about the natural history of amphibians and reptiles. Uh, they're ectothermic, of course. You, you all know that it means that uh, that they uh, that their source of energy, source of heat, is is external. Um, they can be inactive for long periods of time. They are cryptic and mostly solitary, and these two things really make it make it difficult sometimes for us to inventory and monitor these guys. You can't always find them when you want to. Um, they use multiple aquatic and terrestrial habitats, play important roles as predators of prey, and surprisingly, many of these guys are long-lived. Uh, some take 10 to 20 years to reach sexual maturity, and that's not including sea turtles, which are uh, more than that. And the photograph is Justin Conman holding a known age landing turtle at, at 83 years old. Uh, there are four habitat management guidelines um, currently available. Uh, again, the, the one in red is the Northeast. 
the uh, one for the southwest, the area southwest, is just about to be printed. So it will be available soon. So all five regions will then be covered. Uh, these habitat management guidelines uh, include two sets of recommendations from two, two different perspectives. One is for land managers who want to make amphibian and reptile conservation their primary goal. And the other set is for land managers who wish to contribute to the conservation of these animals while maintaining lands for multiple uses. Habitat management guidelines, uh, when applied on the ground as general management principles, they could, they could promote conservation of amphibians and reptiles by keeping common species common, stemming the decline of imperiled species, guiding restoration of amphibian and reptile habitats while benefiting many other species, and reducing the likelihood that additional species will be added to endangered species list. There are a number of challenges, conservation challenges, that are applicable across the entire uh, region, in fact, the entire continent, and we'll list a few of those. Uh, habitat alteration fragmented loss is a, is a very uh, basic challenge to facing amphibians and reptiles, uh, as are roads and trails, uh, invasive exotic introduced species, plants and animals. Fire suppression is important. Landscape scale and habitat connect connectivity is extremely important. And these two pictures show a couple of ways that we approach that. Uh, the use of fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides is a major problem. Uh, let's, let's mention atrazine, which has been getting suppressed lately. Uh, the restoration of habitats, population of common species like fowler's toads and hugnose snakes in, their, in areas that were destroyed is important. Um, con a common conservation challenge. Uh, management of special habitat features such as seepages or rock outcroppings like we find in the Northeast, that's a common challenge for everybody. Exploitations for the pet trade and food, we need to be very careful about who is in fact working or taking uh, animals from the national parks. Subsidized predators, that's an interesting one. A lot of, uh, some people don't, don't know what that is. The raccoon, for example, is a subsidized predator. A, it's a major predator on turtles, adults, and, and, and their eggs and other things. Uh, and they're subsidized because their populations can be larger than they would ordinarily be, uh, but for the, um, uh, the uh, additional food and uh, other things that we supply to them. Um, public education is important, and uh, it's a common challenge because we need to we need to be focusing on aesthetic, ecological, and spiritual value of wildlife. Uh, to get started, if you want to do an inventory, for example, and you need to know what you've got in order to be able to do the conservation, um, first identify potential amphibian reptile habitats, map the locations of habitats in your park. Identify the species known or suspected to occur in each of the habitats, and uh, create uh, management objectives for each area or habitat. And at this point, uh, you need to be aware that there are federal and state regulations that um, impinge one's ability to work with these animals. Um, so we have a point. Uh, 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 pause here for questions that people want to ask them. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have any questions. We don't have any questions okay. in the question box now, but um, we'll give we'll give like 30 seconds to see if anybody um, types any in. Okay. I'm going to turn it over from here to Al Bryce. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Okay. There's no question. Okay. Uh, we do have a question. Um, it says, please right. show the resource management goals again. Al, can you click back to that slide for Joe? Um, resource. I forget where that was. Here. Is that it? Is that what you were talking about? Kathy, is that the slide that you wanted? She said it's the next one. All right. The next one back or the next one forward? Oops. 
the ideal and compatible? She said four words. <laughs> Sorry, this is an, an inefficient way. Sorry. Okay. So this um, goes back to Joe's common conservation challenges slide. And she said, yes, that's the correct one. Okay. Oh. And the question? Um, one second, I'm going to try and... Hey, Kathy, go ahead and ask your question. I just unmuted you. Uh, yes, I was. I'm a land manager at a Western Pennsylvania National Park with a herp refuge, so I wanted to see again what my management priorities would be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think I have all of those, <laughs> except for the fire suppression isn't too bad here. We're we're pretty moist. Okay. Well, maybe as we get, this is Kurt Buhlman, as we go through some of the habitats that we're going to highlight, we will be able to, you'll see some that are specifically uh, of interest to your particular location. All right. Okay, so we have another question here from Jim Hurley, and he says that he is a member of the Blue Ridge Prism. A CWMA, and he wonders about her, um, herbicide impacts, glyphosate, um, mm -hmm. methoxam, uh -huh. trip, uh, sorry, tri cloper, and all and all those things on herbs. That's um, that's great. We are going to have a few um, examples of herbicide use in wetland restoration a little later in the presentation, so that might be of able to answer that at that point. Okay. Um, next question is from Anna Kim, and she wants to know if a 4-H group can conduct an inventory. Um, Anna, that is something that you would have to coordinate. Um, I, if you email me after this um, presentation, I can get you where you need to apply for a research permit and all that, so I can help you with that um, after the webinar. And then, um, Okay, so Jim Jim Hurley was following up with his previous question and just talking about spraying for stiltgrass, honeysuckle, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, um, Jim, I actually just went ahead and unmuted you to make sure that I asked your question properly. So go ahead and, and ask them directly. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. We can. Uh, my, my, my question gets to... Uh, uh, spraying herbicide uh, in forest setting, not necessarily in a wetland setting, uh, still grass, honeysuckle, uh, bittersweet, etc. on the ground, I'm seeing herbs, uh, snakes, salamanders, toads, etc. in the forest, not just in the wetland. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Joe, are you going to um, take that question? Okay, sorry, go ahead. No, uh, this is this is Kurt. I could try to answer a little bit of that a, ahead of of where we are uh, in a presentation. But uh, I've been doing a number of wetland restoration projects in the Northeast in bog turtle wetlands, and what we've been doing is working on an individual plant basis. Basically, where you go in and you cut a piece of purple loosestrife, and the next person dabs that stem with glyphosate that has a blue dye in it, so you can see that you've already hit that one. So we're trying to be very judicious about how much herbicide is going into those wetlands. So um, it, the, there are no strict rules exactly on how people do this, but pretty much people who are trying to restore a bog turtle wetland are not going to broadcast spray herbicide uh, in that in that wetland. They're going to try to work with individual um, in trying to work with individual plants and maybe we'll see that as we go along. Um, I don't have as much experience with hardwood forest work. I can say that some shrub work in wetlands is we've done it the same way using Garlon 4 to try to get um, woody shrubs out by cutting them, treating the stump during a dry season, and and doing that individually. So, but it's time consuming, but that's been the way to try to minimize overspray and too much herbicide in these wetlands. I don't know if that helps. Okay. Um, 
So we'll actually move on from now and and we'll continue the question and answer session in the okay. next block, um, but I want to make sure that we can get through Al's section too. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, this is Al Price and I will begin talking about specific habitat types. The habitat management guidelines are organized by habitat, not by species, and it's based on the understanding that if we effectively manage the habitat, we will benefit a whole suite of species. Here in the Northeast, we've broadly identified eight terrestrial habitat types and six aquatic habitat types. And we're going to be talking about the five habitat types that you see highlighted in red. Uh, we'll begin with the hardwood habitat. That's the actually the major habitat in the Northeast, and it also has the highest diversity of our habitats in the Northeast, with 108 species being found. Uh, the examples we show there, you'll notice that some of them, like the spotted salamander, clearly isn't just a hardwood forest species. It requires the vernal pool for breeding. So you have to recognize when some of these species are going to move from one habitat type to another, uh, you need all aspects of its life history in order to actually benefit the species. One thing when you start uh, each of your analyses, you just think about what are the threats to that particular habitat with forests, there's many threats. Fragmentation of forest flocks. Some species need fairly large uninterrupted forest flocks. There's been a lot of clearing for residential and commercial development. Uh, a growing issue is the decline because of diseases. Oaks, maples, ashes, and hemlocks are declining now. Chestnut is almost completely wiped out, as was the American elm. You don't find those as large, mature trees in our hardwood forests today. And in the past, I used to think of hardwood forests as a place with closed canopy, that it was hard to get invasive species that would survive there. But now we see that there are a number of them, like garlic mustard in the last 20 years has really spread dramatically. Barberry that is sold in nurseries around the country is a really horrible invasive species in some of these systems. And multiflora rose that 30 and 40 years ago was planted as wildlife food is a, is a horrible invasive. So we need to think about those when we're developing our management plan. And then our native white-tailed deer uh, populations have grown because of perhaps inadequate uh, harvest regulations, uh, especially in areas where it's difficult or impossible to harvest them. They do well around human uh, establishments, and they'll destroy your ornamentals as well as the forest system. Under ideal management, we want to maintain some of those older stands. Some of those stands are ones that foresters would look at and wonder why you aren't harvesting. But with those larger trees, there are benefits, and we need to keep some of those stands and not remove them all. We want to restore the forest cover with native species. Any place where those invasives have come in, we want to work to get rid of them. They'll benefit not just the amphibians and reptiles. They'll develop, benefit all types of wildlife. Maintaining woody debris on the forest floor is very important. It provides cover and shelter for a lot of amphibians, a lot of the uh, snakes, lizards, all kinds of things live under and around those uh, down woody debris. And within the hardwood forest, because it's our largest uh, habitat type, you find some unique features, such as these little seasonal wetlands, spring seeks, rock outcrops that uh, provide a little bit of diversity within the forest and, and in turn increase the diversity of the amphibians and reptiles. So we want to avoid fragmenting those large forest blocks 
with roads, even dirt trails, hiking trails, can affect the behavior of uh, snakes that live in the area. White-tailed deer deserves a very special mention here. You see two photographs that look very different, but they're both the result of overpopulations of deer. In the one on the left, the deer have eaten essentially all the native species that they like to eat, and you're ended, ending up with a very open system with large trees but virtually no understory. Some park managers would think that looks great. You have a nice open system for people to hike through, but it is an unnatural system. When it gets even worse, the deer have eaten everything, but there is some of the things that they consider inedible, like multiflora rose, barberry. And those things grow up and make a very choked uh, system, like you see on the right. So we're looking to manage, ideally, a forest system where the deer population is managed for forest health, not necessarily for sportsman satisfaction, which is the case in many states. This is what a healthy forest should look like. You have the trees, some larger, some smaller, lots of different size classes, an understory of saplings a lot of things on the ground, and that benefits the red-back salamander, the wood frog, spring peeper, and all those amphibians and reptiles that use these kind of systems. If you're not primarily interested in managing for the uh, amphibians and reptiles, you can still do things to maximize the compatibility by minimizing or eliminating barriers the dispersal between the habitat types and the, between the habitat units. Many of these species make fairly long migrations between where they overwinter, where they summer, where they nest, or whatever. So they can't do very well in a very small defined system. Locating trails away from sensitive areas like rock outcrops and seasonal wetlands can benefit many of these species. We recognize that some of those rock outcrops and overlooks are there and the people want to view, but you have to cho uh, choose which ones you want people on and not have them everywhere. Site preparation techniques that minimize disturbance of the soil, because many of these species are fossorial. That is, they spend a good portion of their time underground, and they need those tunnels and those passageways in order to have a good population. We had mentioned leaving the dead woody debris, but we also want to leave some of the dead standing trees. They're beneficial to both reptiles and amphibians, things like the rat snakes that may nest in hollow trees. Uh, green salamanders that climb trees, so there's a lot of benefits there. Come on. A little bit more about invasives. You can see on the upper left where barberry has really encroached. I think somebody had asked about prisons. Uh, that's a problem throughout the northeast in fact, north, south, east, and everywhere else, uh, working on issues to eliminate barberry without harming other things. You can see that stump in the bottom of American chestnut. A tree that size probably died 60 or 70 years or more ago, and their stumps remain. They're a very persistent tree, providing some retreat for animals that utilize those, but still you've lost the canopy from these wonderful trees. And the mass that they produce, which would feed the, the mice and the chipmunks, which in turn would feed the snakes. On the right, you see a growing problem, uh, hemlock woolly adelgis. And there are ways to individually, individually treat trees, but in large areas where it's a 
large hemlock forest, we see massive hillsides with virtually nothing but dead hemlock on it. And that's a problem that is moving north. I think it's already reached the capital district of New York. It's in southeastern New England. And eventually, it'll probably expand and include the entire range of the hemlock. One of the projects I worked on was trying to uh, determine if there was a way to coexist with timber rattlesnake. Now, for those of you who don't know, it, timber rattlesnakes are a very long, live animal. They don't reach sexual maturity until they're 8 to 12 years old. They reproduce only every 2 to 3 years in most cases. And they also have large home ranges where they may move from a mile, mile and a half, two and a half, or as much as four miles from their den during the summer for foraging and mating. So we had this issue where a developer wanted to put in 400 homes less than a half a mile from a timber rattlesnake den. And they came up with the idea of putting up a fence to restrict the movement of the snake into the development. Uh, map here showing the TNC property is the property that the developer donated to the Nature Conservancy. And the Nature Conservancy, jointly with the state, uh, conducted this study. An 8,000 foot fence of half inch hardware cloth, four feet high and buried six inches into the ground was erected. The focus was on timber rattlesnakes, but during the study, we noticed that this fence interfered with the movement of more than 20 species, including box turtles, young white-tailed deer that couldn't jump over the fence, turkeys that the hen would be on one side of the fence and the young would be on the other and couldn't get there, and even mallards in you know, a woodland system like this uh, butted their nose up against the fence. Uh, we documented a young hognose snake that got its head stuck in the half-inch hardware cloth and died before we found it. And we also found that ATVs deliberately vandalized the fence. So there was a host of problems with this particular fence. The results of this three-year study, we observed the behavior of rattlesnakes when they encountered the fence. They often coiled up right next to it, trying to figure out what to do next, I guess. And we just tried to determine the fate of the snakes that got on the wrong side of the fence. In this map, you'll see the green dots. Those were the locations of the radio track snakes we had that stayed on the right side of the fence. The red dots, which outnumber the green dots, show the locations of the snakes that actually got into the area where the development was being built. Uh, a total of 13 snakes got over, under, around, or through that particular fence. And of those 13 snakes, we know that six of them died from that encounter. So our conclusion was that this, this particular type of fence construction was not an effective mitigation strategy to keep the timber rattlesnakes out of the nearby development. That doesn't rule out the possibility of using fences in certain situations, and we have in other areas, to effectively manage habitat for other species and even timber rattlesnakes. But you really got to look at it, and when you see a problem like this, you have to come up with a solution as to how you can offset the problems that we encounter. next habitat type we're going to talk about are the pine barrens, so xeric uplands that are dominated by a variety of pines, uh, with jack pine and red pine to the north, and longleaf loblolly in Virginia to the south, and pitch pine just about everywhere else. Uh, this is the one habitat, at least in the northeast, that probably has the highest uh, diversity of lizards. We don't have a lot of lizards in the northeast, but a lot of them do uh, survive in these kind of areas. And even these xeric uplands are used by wetland species, like the fowler's toad, which is a primary food of the hognose snake. So again, think about these pine barrens, but also think about the other habitats the species that live here are also going to need. 
those embedded features, such as those ephemeral wetlands and, again, the springs and seeps and rock outcrops within these uh, pine barren systems are very essential. And in ideal management, these pine barren systems historically were always maintained by wildfire. Native Americans set fires in these areas often to propagate things like blueberry. With the advent of our culture and stopping wildfires, many of these pine forest systems progress beyond the pine barren system into dry oak uh, areas. But if we want to manage them for pine forests, for these animals, we have to use prescribed burns in an ideal situation. And again, we should avoid fragmenting these upland habitats and, as always, work toward preventing the establishment of invasive plant species. In maximizing the cat compatibility, there's a few things we can do. Uh, if you look at those three pictures on the bottom, the one on the left is what a really good pine barren system looks like in the northeast. Tall trees with an open canopy and a shrub and grass layer below, giving us more of the effect of a savanna rather than a closed forest. The picture photo in the middle is a pine plantation, especially in the southern states, turning these pine barren systems into pine plantations where they could grow longleaf and loblolly pine uh, was their focus to produce lumber. But the ground cover is completely missing, almost gone. The species diversity is very low. And then when it came time to harvest, these things were essentially clear cut because they're all kind of even age stands. We can take all the trees out at once and we can leave an area that looks like the photograph on the right. Again, very low species diversity, very little survival and needs to be replanted, but it should be replanted in a manner that more uh, closely resembles that of a natural system with the trees and the shrub layer and grass areas established. We can't spend a lot of time on fire, but it's really essential, especially in these systems. It's also used in wetland systems, not so much in hardwood systems, but it can be a very beneficial tool. Often to restore a habitat, you may need to do other things first, like herbicide, as Kurt mentioned, cutting some of the large trees or whatever. But once you get it into a um, habitat that resembles the good natural system, you can use periodic burning to help just maintain that successional uh, uh, condition so it doesn't become dominated by the hardwood a dry oak species that might overtake it. Uh, if you're going to use prescribed burning, you really have to talk to someone who's an expert in it, uh, who can develop a burn plan that identifies the season that it's best done in, the intensity of the fire desired, the weather conditions of the day of the burn, and all kinds of things. And it can be done on a very small scale of just a couple of acres. It can be done on a larger scale of hundreds of acres. One of the projects that was conducted in the Pine Barrens, where in New Jersey there seemed to be a deficit of suitable hibernacula for snake species uh, in areas where there wasn't a lot of human disturbance, and Bob Zapper Lurdy and Howard Reiner worked on developing these artificial snake hibernacula initially for the corn snakes and pine snakes, but this technique has been expanded to a number of other species and not just in pine barren systems anymore. But it's a very effective tool. It, it uh, had a lot of success, and actually hundreds of these have been built in the Northeast now uh, doing quite a good job, but not always. There is always problems when you create things like this. 
it, it's really benefited these species, and we found that transplanting snakes to them, they adapt to it, and just building it in an area where the snakes are already known to reside are attracted to it. They find it, they use it. And that's the end of the first two sessions. Does anybody uh, have any questions? Um, yep, you have several questions here, Al. So the this is a three-part question, but it says, how effective are wildlife tunnels, and do you include barrier fences to direct herps to the tunnels? Uh, yes, um, there's a new book out that I recommend you look at uh, called Roads and Ecological Infrastructure, Concepts and Applications for Small Animals. It has a lot of information, not just for amphibians and reptiles, but for other small animals, not the large animals. Uh, you have to look at each situation, and it has to be, be designed to fit that situation. They can be very effective. They're most effective if you have drift fences to direct the animals to them, because usually they don't all cross the road in one two-meter stretch. There's spread out over several hundred meters. But there are certainly focal areas where you get a lot of road kills, and those would be areas you'd like to focus on. But there's all kinds of issues in building them. Uh, you don't want to build a tunnel that becomes a trap because the predators, the raccoons, the skunks, and the foxes figure that's a good place to sit on the night when you know that the amphibians are moving and get a meal. So you've got to look at a lot of aspects, but they have proved to be very beneficial in quite a few areas. And the interest in them is growing dramatically. And you can go from relatively simple ones to some of the massive overpasses or underpasses that allow herds of elk to go through. Uh, there's really no size limit there. Um, I can provide that citation, too, in the chat box for everybody. Um, so your next uh, question that'll is... That will be on our handout. Oh, okay. Uh, we, we decided we didn't want to distribute until after the presentation was over, because we didn't want people spending their time reading it rather than watching our slides. Oh, sure. I can um, definitely send that out after the webinar. Um, so your next question is, is a dead tree more valuable to herbs standing or on the ground? Uh, well, from my perspective, most of them are more beneficial on the ground. Uh, but you do need some standing ones. But we, we want to see a large amount of downed woody debris on the ground of various sizes and various uh, species of trees, too. Okay, and your next question is, how do you feel about using soil injection sprays for hemlock woolly adelgid? And um, the follow-up sentence is, we do not broadcast spray soils or bark, but stem injection is too expensive. So again, how do you feel about soil injection sprays for hemlock woolly adelgid? I'll let Kurt take that one. I, some of those photos, can you hear me? Yes, we can. So uh, some of those individual trees that you saw on when Al was showing the presentation had little red tags on them, and that was up in the mountains of North Carolina. And there were communities that were actually able to protect uh, and inject individual trees. It seems like it's a very difficult uh, prospect for going out and getting entire forests, but they were working working on individual stands and then they were marking the trees with those red tags when they had when they had treated them to be able to come back and evaluate the results um, so I'm not sure how the uh, how on a broader scale we can get the hemlock adelgid problem under control right now but certainly for individual stands it seems to be workable Okay, thanks, Kurt. And the next question is for Al. It says, what was the new solution to keep the timber rattlesnakes out of the development since the fence did not work? That, uh, sadly, was one of the instances where uh, the fence just wasn't going to work. We did enlist 
a local resident who uh, volunteered to be our rattlesnake responder. They were trained and given a uh, license to handle the snakes. They were told what to do with them, and they're on call. Uh, there's actually a couple people in that area that are on call from any of the people living in that development. But the fence itself uh, just wouldn't keep the animals out. Now, the sad thing here is that when the snakes leave the den, they're kind of programmed which way to go. Some go north, some go south, some go east, some go west. Those that would move in a direction upslope and away from this development have a pretty good chance of long-term survival. Those that were programmed because they've always moved south continue to move south in the development. And each year, we lose a few snakes eventually that segment of the population will be eliminated. And the people won't have as many problems, but we will lose a segment of that population. OK, and last question before we move on to Kurt is many times the fire prescription required to achieve your habitat objectives are not herp friendly. So how do you balance your vegetative needs with the viability of the herp population? Maybe you could repeat that question again, Jen. I was I'm sorry. Getting myself organized with the as the next okay. speaker, but go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so it says many times the fire prescription required to achieve your habitat objectives mm -hmm. are not herp friendly. So how do you balance your vegetative right. needs with the viability of the herp population? That's a great question because, uh, in, especially with wetlands, and I'm going to show this in in, in another couple slides here. Um, we often burn wetlands during the, or we burn during the winter months, and we don't burn wetlands at all. Uh, the problem is when we do prescribed burns in the winter, that's often when amphibians are migrating to vernal pool breeding habitats. That's not the natural season of fire, and that's not evolutionarily when amphibians are dealing, would normally deal with fire. So I do believe that we need to start thinking more about fire in an evolutionary sense, not just when it's safe and when we can do it. Because in some cases, burning in the winter may actually be doing a lot of harm. I'm not saying it's doing more harm than good, because we need more fire in the system. But fires often occur during the summer months when it's hotter, it's drier, you're going to get a lightning strike. And when wetlands are dry, and when you can actually, besides the uplands, you burn through the wetlands, you get the brush out of there, you get the dominant grasses out so that there's a greater diversity of plant life. And the amphibians and the turtles and the are not there when the wetlands are dry. In many cases, turtles are out buried on land underneath leaf litter and, and duff. They're not going to get burned. They're not in the wetlands. So um, it's something to think about. We need to think about evolutionarily where species, uh, where fire should be uh, used and at what time. And hopefully I have, I have an example slide on that just coming up. So I hope that will help answer that question, but it's a great question. OK. Thanks, Kurt. And I just wanted to let you know um, that we are, it's a, a high likelihood that we're going to run over because it, um, we're mm -hmm. at 10.22 Mountain Time now. Mm -hmm. but just don't worry about it. These are great questions, and there's obviously a lot of interest generated in the slides and the material. Um, so continue on. Well, well let me ask uh, just quickly. I just advanced to a seasonal isolated wetland slide. Is that what people are seeing? Yep, absolutely. So you're seeing my Looks screen. OK. Yeah. So um, I'm Kurt Buhlman, and I have the opportunity of privilege today to talk uh, with the group about some of the aquatic habitats and the issues with habitat management. And what we're going to look at is some seasonal wetland examples, some permanent wetland examples, and riverine stream examples. So hopefully, we'll just go through that. And I'll try not to run over. I'll try to get those through in the next few minutes here. Um, seasonal isolated wetlands go by many names. Um, many of you all are very familiar in the Northeast with vernal pools. These are wooded, wooded habitats that are dry for most of the year, but tend to fill during the winter and spring months. Uh, 
famously used by spotted salamanders like you see up in the up a upper right corner there but there's many other amphibian species that use these vernal seasonal pools um, and there's other reptiles that use these as well Blanding's turtles and spotted turtles may not be in them all year round but they come in the spring months and they feed on tadpole and salamander larva uh, when they are abundant so some of the ideal management for seasonal wetlands, uh, first off, is to maintain some of the native vegetation, the terrestrial vegetation around these habitats, because that's where your salamanders, like the spotted salamander, the tiger salamander in these pictures, are most of the year. They're only in the wetlands when they come there to breed and when the larvae are maturing. Now, obviously, that is cycled with the wet-dry cycle of these wetlands. One of the main issues with some of these wetlands is people are often prone to stock fish in them. Uh, that's kind of a waste of time from everyone's perspective uh, because eventually they dry out and the fish all die, but while they're there, they can certainly predate all the amphibian larvae that are in there. You certainly want to try to protect these areas from siltation and so on and runoff and erosion. Certainly don't let four-wheelers and folks hike through. Maybe, you know, hiking through them is fine when they're dry, but being careful that bike trails and things don't go through them. And a lot of times, these wetlands, because they're dry for so much of the year, they're not noticeable as wetlands to the common layperson. So uh, some of these habitats, and they don't get protection under wetland laws uh, in many of them, but some of the most diverse ones are these type of seasonal wetlands, like in this picture here, uh, in terms of importance for amphibian species in the Northeast. So trying to maintain habitat connectivity. So these animals, if they're breeding in these wetlands, or in the case of the spotted turtle, foraging for food in vernal pools, they need to be able to get through safe habitat to the next vernal pool, especially since these wetlands dry up at different times of the year. Uh, they may be in one at some point, it dries up, they have to be able to travel to the next one. So having these habitats fragmented in the landscape by clear cuts or by busy roads. Uh, you saw uh, earlier Al talked about, you know, cor corridors under roads. That's so that spotted salamanders can actually get from a forest on one side of the road to the breeding pool on the other side of the road. If we can avoid doing that in the first place, having that fragmentation, we're all better off. So. A lot of activities that we minimize impacts of these seasonal wetlands is really important for some of the, uh, the really interesting amphibians and reptiles of the Northeast. Um, permanent wetlands are the wetlands that we kind of consider to stay full most, year, uh, most of the year. And the species that we find in them are very different. Snapping turtles, painted turtles, instead of spotted turtles and Blanding's turtles that we would find in the seasonal wetlands. Um, green frogs, bullfrogs, this is where they belong. Uh, wood frogs tend to be one of the species that breeds in the seasonal vernal pools. Uh, we have bog turtles down here as a permanent wetland species. I'm going to talk about that. That's a slightly different example, but truly their wetland stays wet all year round, even though it's not the same type of wetland as we might take a look at right here. But 87 species in permanent wetlands in the Northeast. So Again, maintaining the natural vegetation in some of these wetlands. Some of these in the Northeast are very interesting with being uh, glacial uh, lakes, uh, fens. Uh, there's some really interesting wetlands uh, that are in the Northeast that are natural wetlands. But things like farm ponds also fall under the same category. So you can have a, a farm pond made in a, in a out in a pasture in Pennsylvania, and it will have quite a few of the same species as a wetland that was naturally a glacial-made wetland. Um, you want to try to avoid the introduction of exotic species and exotic plants. That's difficult. Um, you see down in the lower right-hand corner, this picture of stand of Phragmites. Uh, Phragmites is something that really does get established in some of these permanent wetlands and is can be treated with herbicide, with glyphosate. It can be dealt with with fire. Uh, and combinations of both tend to be the most effective to trying to get rid of stands of Phragmites, but they do become the dominant 
vegetation if we're not careful and just ruin the diversity of, of vegetation that you would see in these wetlands. So um, some of the best things for maintaining the compatibility with these things are to make sure that for reptiles and amphibians particularly are maintaining the water levels uh, at say winter time of year. Uh, and in many cases, a permanent wetland may be a waterfowl impoundment. And often, wildlife managers will be draining those at certain times of the years for waterfowl. But that could be real detrimental to hibernating turtles, for example, if all of a sudden the wetland is drained in winter and the turtles in the mud are exposed to freezing temperatures and now the mud freezes where before they were buried under safely under three feet of flowing water. Um, some of the other issues are, as you can see on the lower right, that is a, a permanent wetland that was ditched. Uh, you know, the farmer intended he didn't want the wetland there. So there's a ditch put in that habitat, and both sides of that ditch were once a wetland. And you can almost picture it as the same as the one on the left. It's not the same site, but you could picture it that way. Uh, so restoring some of these wetlands is maybe, in some cases, not that difficult if we can plug up ditches where things have been drained and reflood some of these reflood some of these habitats. I do want to mention something about fire and restoration of wetlands with fire. The um, prescribed fire at the right time, and that's I think what one of the uh, participants was getting at with the question a little earlier. Um, you want to be able to burn wetlands so that you do not impact the amphibian species species that live there or are coming there to breed. Plus, you want it to be effective in terms of changing the vegetative structure. On the left-hand column, that is the same picture on top and bottom there. And that wetland was burned in the winter, but when there was about several inches of water in that wetland. So all the fire did when it came in was burn off that dead grass. The next summer, all you see is a regrowth of that panic grass. It's the same structure, it's the same species, it's just green instead of brown. On the right side is a wetland. Again, it was also burned in late winter. I'd prefer to see these being burned in the growing season because I think that's when they'll be less likely to impact um, um, amphibians or reptiles. But this particular wetland was really dry. Down, It was one that didn't fill up burned out a lot of the dead grasses, a lot of button bush and shrubbery that was in the edge. And you can see in the picture below, that is the exact same photograph. So you've got later on, two years later, you can see what species diversity is down there in the, in the substrate, but it gets one species ends up dominating without fire in them. And you can actually really restore some of the diversity of these wetlands. Now, I will tell you that these, both these examples are of Carolina bays in the southeast U.S. So um, maybe the situation will be a little bit different in the northeast. But fire should be something we think about in terms of wetland um, restoration activities. Um, bog turtles are one of the really important species of, we'll consider it a permanent wetland here in, in the northeast. Really beautiful little animal, um, federally uh, threatened. Um, in the northeast, right in the center there. This species lives in the habitat that you see in the middle right. That's their favorite stuff where you see sedge grass clumps. That's the perfect example of a bog turtle habitat where there's open water, turtles can get between these sedge, sedge tussocks, there's muck in the bottom. What happens now because of invasive plants, if you look all the way over on the far left and you see someone setting up to herbicide, all the reed canary grass that has gotten into these wetlands. It becomes like a mat, like a thatch mat. And it kills the sedges, and it becomes the, the, the bog turtles don't have the ability to burrow into the muck. They don't have the ability to nest in the tops of the sedge tussocks because they're all gone. And basically, bog turtles disappear from that type of wetland. Uh, in the center picture, one of um, my colleagues actually with one little bottle of glyphosate, and we're going through, and we're individually cutting out, in this case, purple loosestrife but just individually cutting and individually treating. However, in wetlands where reed canary grass has taken over, you do need to almost broadcast spray, and that's what's going to happen on the left side there. But the bog turtles aren't there anymore. We're trying to restore it so that they could be there. 
Uh, you could also individually cut um, red maples by girdling on the lower left. Uh, it's time consuming and it you end up gouging up your hands too, but it works because you kill trees individually and you don't have all the debris to haul out. The trees just die slowly and drop their branches over time and you don't have a lot of buildup of debris. I will say in the upper right hand corner, that's been a big threat to bog turtle wetlands is just ditching. Uh, and hopefully we don't have a whole lot of that going on in Northeast anymore. We're working with that in Virginia a little bit. In the bottom, farming and cattle help keep open these habitats. But cattle aren't the exact perfect managers of the habitat. What you had in the far bottom right corner, mastodons were probably the animal, them, those, maybe elk and bison that really kept some of these habitats open for bog turtles. But that's just um, just a throw that out there just for a little bit of thinking about how these habitats might have been managed long before us. Um, one of the other things with managing and trying to restore some of these wetlands, and bog turtle wetlands are a perfect example of this, is farmers often drain these wetlands and put these tile drains into the wetland bottoms. Um, if you can find these things, one, if you got a bulldozer and you can take them out, you can do that, but that's a lot of destruction again to take them out. Uh, I've had some really good success on this one example here where we found the tile drains, we found a junction point where several tile drains all came together, we dug it out, cleaned it out, and we plugged it with concrete, and you can see that the wetland, which was basically a everyone by everyone else's um, perspective, a dry pasture, all of a sudden it flooded back up and it is truly supposed to be a wetland. It's going to take many years, you can see that in the lower corner, for the wetland vegetation to come back in because that is a dry pasture vegetation now, but by plugging up those drains we got a wetland back in that in that site. So it's something to think about. They're doable and it wasn't that difficult to do actually. Um, I'm going to let, I, I believe that Al might like to speak about this uh, Blanding's turtle example here. Are you, uh, was, would Al, would you like to do that? Yes. Sure. Okay. And I can advance the slide for you uh, as you what, wish. Well, or switch it back to me either way. Uh, I, can, I can do that. You have two slides and then I'm going to talk some more. So, oh, uh, okay. well, if I only have two, then let's keep it on you. Yep. Okay. All right. This was a project uh, near a high school where they wanted to do a and the parking lot and an athletic field, and it would have resulted in the loss of some habitat used by the Blaney turtles and also loss of some of the nesting habitat. Next slide. So what was worked out was an idea of creating an area that would be separated from the high school. And you can see on that picture, you see the line here. I hope you can see that and you see my pointer, that is a one-way fence, that one-way barrier, chain link fence that elevated above the athletic field uh, and keeps everybody from the school out of the Blaney's turtle site and all the Blaney's turtles and other turtles out of the athletic field. If, however, they somehow got around the barrier there were these gaps where the turtles could come over, get over the barrier, but they couldn't get back up. What was done was a device was built that would come in and pick up pieces of the old wetland that was going to be filled for the parking area and transplanted them into areas dug out in the middle of some of the marginal habitat that was on site and protected in the fence. And they recreated this wetland that's shown right in the middle here. That's the, what the vegetation looked like less than one year after it was moved. They moved shrubs that were 8 to 10 feet tall. They moved clumps and tussocks and everything. So it was a very quick move. They created a few open upland areas for nesting rather than in the past. The turtles would try to nest in the athletic field. And this whole system uh, showed that if you really wanted to, if you were willing to put the effort in, uh, you could actually 
within a one-year period create habitat that the turtles would continue to use and nest in. It, it, this was one of our more successful projects. It was one headed up by Eric Sidiat at uh, Bard College and his crew, and they they did just a really a wonderful job. Nice. Okay. Nice. I'll just take over just a little bit more and say we're going to move just quickly to rivers and streams. I know we're over time already, uh, but there's quite a few species in the Northeast that use our rivers and streams. Uh, map turtles are really a prominent species in some of the northern areas in the river systems and the bigger lakes. Wood turtles are a species that you will see in the smaller streams, and they do occur on some National Park Service properties in the Northeast. Um, and we also have things like softshell turtles that are also often found with the map turtles in in the larger rivers. Ideal management for some of the for some of these species is to try to maintain natural bank vegetation, natural flow of the rivers, the substrates on the bottoms, so that we're not uh, you know dammed up areas often become silted in. Map turtles don't like silted up ponded conditions. That's why they live in rivers. They like flowing areas and they like their food as mussels and snails and, and even Asiatic clams at this point. So they need clear flowing water and they need natural basking sites as well. Often these areas are taken out to help with boating passage and all. So keep that in mind. It may not seem like a big deal, but if all of the riverbank vegetation and snags are taken out, you lose the ability for these turtles to bask. And as Joe pointed out early on, they're ectothermic. They need to warm up and they need to bask. So when you lose habitat like that, eventually it's not the best habitat for the for these species. There are certainly, you know, we hate to see rivers get um, silted or erosion, and there are ways of fixing these things. Um, this is there's a lot of construction going on in this picture in the lower photograph, but the silt fence is there to keep sediment from going in, as are the as is the the rock gravel. You need to keep the rivers clear because turbid water and silt filled water will not allow for mud puppies, for example, to continue. They need the clear, clean water to to persist. It doesn't take a, silted, a river to stay all muddy and red and silted up for long before that species would absolutely disappear from that river. Uh, you know, you can only breathe, they breathe um, oxygen through their gills and it's going to get clogged up and not going to live very long uh, in, clean, in clogged up systems. Wood turtles are probably one of my second favorite animals to bog turtles, maybe the first one. Uh, and they are the bog turtle's closest cousin, actually. Uh, they're both the genus Glyptomys. Uh, small gravel flowing streams, like you see in that upper picture there, are where they live. They hibernate under those banks of where they can get deep under a, up under a bank in the winter, and it's still flowing water. Yet they can be breathed, have stick their heads up and breathe up under the way back under the banks and not freeze. Um, that's the bank's native vegetation is really important to them. That's where the blackberries grow. That's where they have shelter and find all kinds of slugs and food to eat. In that lower corner, though, when we get these habitats, these streams have been channelized straight. To, you know, landowners often don't like meandering boundaries, so they end up the things have been channelized. Now we have a muck bottom, steep banks, and in this case, we have multi-floor rows covering the banks. Wood turtles can't persist in that. Although they might do fine in, in the summer, they can't find a safe place to hibernate in that straight stream. Um, they will get flushed out in the winter. They don't have a place to hide up under, get safely up under a bank. So they're susceptible to flooding, uh, siltation. Um, you need this habitat to look like the upper right-hand corner for wood turtle population to persist there. Um, I think one of the issues, I just wanted to throw this in here, um, in many of our national parks, they are managed for either cultural, historic regions. I think you saw um, the battlefield from Valley Forge in one of the earlier photos. And also you have um, Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area. A species like a wood turtle lives in the streams, like we just saw in the previous picture, but acts like a box turtle during the summer. 
they're out in the fields and meadows. If we had a, a, a conflict with cultural management in a park with natural needs, we can fix that sometimes by thinking about what if we mowed that battlefield, uh, kept it the mower heights eight inches and above. That doesn't mean we won't run over a turtle occasionally with the tractor tires, but we won't smash them up in, in the blades. And this turtle on the right is a radio track wood turtle that the mower has successfully gone over and not hurt. So maybe that's something, just little things like that, we can think about that uh, when we're managing parks for both cultural resources, we want people out on the battlefields or so on, or in fields, but we also want the this natural, the species there. This is something we can consider, just simple things like that. So um, sometimes we can restore some of the stream habitats very simply. Not very elegant, but if we lost the all the log snags, we can make basking platforms for turtles like you see in the right side. They just need to be able to get out and warm up and thermoregulate appropriately. Uh, and sometimes a sunken dock like that, although not very pretty, it works. And we can do something like that. Likewise, we can make nesting habitats where we've lost natural shoreline habitat like in, in the upper left because we've built a big marina or so, or everyone's put lawns down to the edge of the water. But uh, as Al had shown, you can actually make a nesting area in a marina and you end up with softshell turtles nesting on it. Also down in the lower right, if the predators are keying in on something like that, you can go out there and cover turtle nests with covers. It's done on sea turtle nests. This is wood turtle nests that we're covering up in New Jersey. Um, it can be done and you can simply uh, avoid losing some of that year's reproduction by giving them places to nest and then protecting them. I know we haven't had a chance to talk about all the habitats that are in this, and so that's kind of just a very quick look through some of the aquatic habitats. Uh, but what I would call everyone's attention to is the uh, habitat management guidelines that PARC has made, and they're identified in the handouts that you have, will are helpful in giving itemized, bulleted, ideal, and compatible management strategies for all the habitats that you see listed here, even though um, the three of us today only really had a chance to talk about the ones that we highlighted. So uh, with that, I'd be happy to take questions or uh, turn it over to my colleagues to take questions as well. And we certainly, if people are interested, would encourage you to come and, and, um, and join us at the next Northeast Park meeting, which will be held at Green Mountain College in Vermont uh, the 9th through the 11th of August this year. And I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Kurt. Um, I also wanted to point out to, um, to those people who might be interested in the Southeastern webinar that will be coming up in the fall. The first speaker, who is Joe Mitchell, um, on this webinar, and the third speaker, the one you just heard, who is Kurt Buhlman, they will actually be giving the Southeastern webinar as well, um, along with two other individuals. So, um, you know, be sure I love to the Northeast. This is Kurt. I'm, I'm actually <laughs> on the phone here from the Southeast, from South Carolina right now. I hope no one holds that against me, but I did spend the last month in Massachusetts and New Jersey, so, uh, and I miss it because it's hot down here. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, let's see. A question here says, should we be concerned about terrestrial turtles getting caught in prescribed burns during the summer? That's a good question. Um, and it just, the, it is, it is a good question. Both wood turtles and box turtles spend a good amount of time out on, well, box turtles all the time, but wood turtles spend a good amount of time out in kind of pasture habitats and forested areas, riparian areas along those streams. Um, and they are from our radio tracking work out there in the summers. Um, they certainly head back by November to those to the streams where they're in, uh, in once it starts getting cool in the evening. So maybe that's a way to avoid uh, some of the issues. I can say that aquatic turtles down here in the south that are in those Carolina bays, they actually leave those wetlands when they're dry and bury themselves in the sand substrate 
in pine forests, but they're deep enough that if you ran a prescribed fire over them, you burned the leaf litter off, but you don't burn them. But occasionally, uh, all of us have found box turtles with burn scars on them. I would, yeah, I think it is a concern, and it's just a matter of of knowing um, maybe the, the amount of animals in that population. Um, if it's hot and dry, they're going to be try to be buried and out of sight. I mean, trying to conserve moisture and all as well. So it might be uh, minimized at that time. Um, it certainly would be minimized in the fall. Okay, thanks, Kurt. Um, and somebody had asked a question as to whether there have been management guidelines that have been published um, that provide techniques and timing for prescribed burns that aim to minimize or avoid amphibian mortality. Wow, uh, this you is Joe. I don't. I'm not aware of any, to be honest. Uh, my wife works on a a uh, endangered species down here in the south, um, the frosted flatwood salamanders. And uh, we, they've discovered that uh, burning in the wintertime basically burns them all up, and that's why we have so few of them, in part. But I don't, I don't know of any published guidelines that, uh, that, that do that. And it's a very complex system, very complex situation. So I don't know that you know one set of guidelines is going to work everywhere. Right. But um, along those lines, this is, this is Kurt. Um, uh, fellows who are studying uh, gopher frogs in North Carolina find that they migrate from the wetlands to stump holes that may be hundreds of meters away, and they're completely fine during hot summer burns, but those frogs migrate back to the wetlands during February and March, where they sit under clumps of wire grass during their transit back and between the wetlands. And if that's when the fire goes through, they found their radio tagged gopher frogs burned up. So, um, so yeah, I think it's a matter of knowing what the impossibly tying your knowledge of the inventory of the species that you know are in your park with what you want to do. Um, and knowing that if the case, the only amphibians you have to worry about are spotted salamanders and you know they migrate in February, well, let's not burn in February. But in another place, maybe that doesn't have those amphibians, maybe it's OK to try to get a winter burn to help get the vegetation under control. Because certainly we understand that you've got to do that in areas especially that haven't been burned in a long time. But uh, as Joe mentioned, we now know that the flatwood salamanders with, that come to the edge of the grassy edges of seasonal wetlands in um, the Florida Panhandle, they get burned up by winter burns at that time of year. So. Um, Elise, this is Jen. I just wanted to call your attention to that on the Midwest Park site, which is www.mwparc.org, they have a, um, it's like a prescription burn guidelines for herps. And I do believe that they have published citations at the bottom of that page. And again, I know it's another region of the country, but there might be some helpful information on, on that page as well. Um, so just some information from Adrian. She says that we have conducted prescribed burns and gone through to flush herps just ahead of time. And it really does help save lives. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And then here's another question. Is Japanese knotweed becoming a serious problem on small stream banks? And what efforts can be made to control this invasive species? I haven't tried to treat knotweed myself. And I actually would have, defer to anyone else who would know something about the best herbicides, perhaps, to use. Or is it a, a hand pulling operation? Uh, hand, uh, hand pulling not work with. Japanese knotweed, uh, every little bit of rootlet that gets left just keeps regrowing. Uh, the only thing we've found effective in New York is cutting stems and applying herbicide like you said you do with other species. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Somebody jumped in here to say we've used clear cast on knotweed and fall treatments only. Okay. Okay. Clear and cannon. another question here says, can you talk about the effects of artificial nest sites attracting predators and the overall effect on yeah. turtle populations? Sure. Um, I didn't. I took some slides out that I had in here. We've been building um, 
basically substitute nesting areas um, for wood turtles and diamondback terrapins in two different spots. And we've had really good luck building. Uh, we've built basically elevated dirt mounds, 18 feet long and 8 feet wide, um, in a pasture um, out of refuge in New Jersey, and where we had no um, open habitat left uh, for the turtles to nest in, and they will come to that. And you can even show it to them. Sometimes when female wood turtles are poking around on a roadside across the stream from this nesting area, I've actually picked them up carefully, carried them over to that nesting, that dirt nesting area, and if they didn't nest on it that night, they came back the nest night and nested there, and they've come back repeatedly in subsequent years on their own. Um, so they will use it. One of the issues you need to be aware of, though, is that if you make one compact nesting area and then you have a population of snapping turtles, they get in there, they start nesting on it, and now you have a lot of eggs and you attract raccoon predators. So what we've done with this wood turtle population is we actually go out each evening and we look for wood turtles nesting on it, and we watch them, they nest, and we cover the nests and protect them. Uh, but there, the next day, there are dug up snapper nests right next to those wood turtle nests so that we protected. So that is an issue. Um, with diamondback terrapins, there's been a lot of efforts to keep terrapins off the roads in the southeast, uh, southeast and like on the, along the Jersey Shore um, and all the causeways that go out to the barrier islands and people put up fencing. The problem with just putting up fencing is that turtles hit that fencing, walk along the fence to the end, and then they get out and get hit on the road because they're looking for the highest well-drained site, which sometimes is the, dot, is the yellow line in the center of the road. So the question is, and I think you might have seen this in Al's presentation on the, on the Blanding's turtle habitat reconstruction, if you create nesting areas within, between the boundary, between the wetland and the road for diamondback terrapin, you can get them to walk along that fence, nest on an elevated area that they encounter, and once they've nested, they go back to the wetland. They don't keep trying to get around the fence and end up out on the road. So there are ways that are, are working out to do this. We've been actually doing that on the Jekyll Island Causeway in South Georgia, and it's working really well. So um, things to think about. Okay, and there's another um, comment that says we've used milestone on knotweed and that Michigan DNR has been researching fire effects and techniques on eastern box turtle populations. Um, it says that they've learned a lot over the last five years and should have something published soon. Okay. Um, and everything else is, uh, there, there's another issue that we can resolve after the um, presentation, but everything else is just um, compliments and everything. So um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, and especially Joe, Al, and Kurt for taking the time to share their expertise on amphibian and reptile conservation and management in the Northeast. Um, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks for tuning in. All right.